It's pina coladas until I, can, I can't walk. There you go. Can't be much more plain than that, can I? <laughs> and you, Steve? Yeah, I'm just looking forward to getting out in the beer garden, really. I think the same as most people and sitting within close proximity to others. Oh, wouldn't that be a dream? <laughs> but until we can do that, we can do something over Zoom and that's talk about the news headlines. So the first story this week actually has quite a lot to do with pubs and beer gardens. It's from Prime Minister Boris Johnson, who mentioned earlier this week that individual pub owners could be able to decide whether or not guests need vaccine proof to be let in. And Johnson has since assured that this won't be coming into force right away with many millions still left to get their vaccine. And he's been met with criticism from both the hospitality sector and MPs on his own back bench, saying that it's neither feasible nor appropriate. Do you think there is a role for vaccine passports in UK society? Can you, do you think it will help us return to normality or does it clash with the values that we have here in the UK? Sean, me? Yeah, I'm waiting, <laughs> um, waiting for you. So, I mean, so personally myself, I, I mean, I've, I've already had one of the vaccines. I think Sean, Sean's done the same um, for medical reasons, high risk and stuff. So it doesn't really impact me if there was to be a vaccine passport but i do understand like the hospitality sector being kind of annoyed with it because then then having to police a whole new set of rules you know and then you look on the, the other side of the people should we really force people into having certain vaccines there's going to be certain people who aren't going to be allowed to have the vaccine maybe pregnant women people with certain health conditions children you know if you want to turn up to the pub with your kids you know is that going to be against the rules um I think I think Johnson's probably engaged his mouth before he, his brain really at some point with this, rather than just saying you know it's something we're looking at. We don't know what's going on. I think he made an off the cuff remark, and then obviously every newspaper runs with it and go right. Johnson said we've need a passport. I don't know if he actually actually thinks that or whether there's it's going to happen. But it, it is logical to explore certain options and look at certain things. So it, it is a confusing one, really. I think we've got to kind of wait to see what actually happens with the vaccine rollout, which so far has been amazing. You know, we could end up with nearly all the country vaccines within a couple of months anyway. It might not need a, a passport because everybody's immune. Sean, what are your thoughts? Um, personally, whilst not everyone has had the opportunity to be vaccinated, uh, and bear in mind that you know I am involved in a nightclub and a pub. My answer would be no. There should not be vaccine passports. Uh, once we get to the point where everyone has been offered the vaccine, then it becomes a personal choice as to whether you have it or you yeah. don't. And at that point, I believe that landlords, publicans, nightclub owners should think about whether um, vaccine passports would be something to introduce. Um, because you're not denying anyone their rights. Now, everyone's been offered the vaccine. Uh, personal choice not to have it may mean that you cannot enter certain places. And it's not just nightclubs and pubs. It's theatres uh, and, and other venues. Now, uh, at nightclubs especially, we already use a lot of restrictions to people coming in, you know, whether there's a dress code or checking people aren't overly intoxicated. Um, and personally, um, <laughs> I mean, we use a scan net system. So you have to show a passport or a driving license that the system scans and stores your information. And it wouldn't be too much of a hassle to, to introduce a vaccine passport into that procedure. Um, I would rather not see them, I'm going to be honest. Um, but as I say, um, when it gets to the point where everyone has been offered the vaccine and it's a personal choice not to be vaccinated, then I think that, you know, you can't really have any arguments if individual landlords decide to put vaccine passports as an entry requirement into their venue. Some people have argued that the vaccine should remain as a personal choice and that if vaccine passports start to become a really integral part of daily life in the UK, that people are going to have the assumption that the vaccine is something that's being done to them and not for them. Do you think it would be feasible to also have other ways in which people can prove that they're COVID free, whether that's an antibody test, if they've recently had it, a lateral flow test, or do you think that that would make things far too complicated for nightclub owners, landlords, publicans, etc.? Sean? Well, anything, anything is feasible. 
you know we we've talked quite extensively about using lateral flow tests to open up the nighttime economy quicker uh, so yeah you know that that could be one way of uh, you know proving that you you aren't infectious uh, so you've got the vaccine you've got lateral flow tests you could have an antibody test you know there are, there are various ways and means of doing it but uh, you know it's your personal choice if you don't want the vaccine it's also a landlord's personal choice as to whether you can come into that venue or not so if you don't have the vaccine and the, and the landlord wants you to have the vaccine to make sure that him or her and their staff and their customers uh, aren't at risk of contracting coronavirus. That's their choice and you've got to respect that as well. Steve, can you see these multiple factors playing a role? Um, yeah, yeah, obviously. And science is obviously going to keep progressing. You know, we might end up with a, a lick stick, which tells you instantly whether you've got COVID. We don't know where it's going to go. I mean, the only thing I would say is, and like I say, I am in, I'm in favour of having the vaccine. I've had the vaccine. But I'm sure people go into nightclubs and pubs with many infectious diseases. You know, what, do we require vaccinations and proof of vaccination for, for everything? You know, STIs and stuff like that. It's just at what point do you say to people, actually, you've got proof that, you know, you haven't got certain certain infectious diseases that you can pass on in general? You know, so... Stephen, STIs aren't transmissible, transmissible through your breath. Uh, well, actually, if you're kissing somebody, they are, aren't they? You, know? <laughs> you make a personal choice to kiss someone. Your breath can be breathed in by someone else, yeah. you know, without <laughs> without kissing them. Yeah, but you, you don't. You don't. You, obviously, you know, I'm kind of playing devil's advocate here a little bit. But you don't. You don't check with somebody before you kiss them if they've had cold sores or if you know you. If you're no. going for a snog with somebody, I'm going in for a snog. <laughs> you know, at what point do you start stop checking? You're completely missing the point, Stephen. It is a voluntary choice to kiss someone. It is not a voluntary choice to breathe in a coronavirus from someone else who's breathed it out. That, that's the difference. But, you know, you, you, you then take away the voluntary choice of, you know, the, the vaccine in a sense, don't you? Which it, I think the old debate's over. It's so, I mean, as it all comes down to numbers and what we actually know. I mean, because if, if I've had the vaccine, I'll, I should have the, next, the second one in a couple of weeks. If I'm, you know, very low risk, does it really bother me if somebody else has got it? I don't know. Does it? Is it? Can I catch it from somebody? You know, it's there's a lot of different variations of things going on here. You know, if it's in society in general, you know, do we all end up having to prove we've got the flu vaccine because I'm high risk from the flu every year? What you're doing, Stephen, is you're, you're elucidating your personal choices. And what I'm doing is I'm elucidating the, per, elucidating the personal choice of a landlord. You know, you can stand at his door all day arguing this, that and the other. Um, but it's his choice as to whether he lets you in or not. Yes, I agree. Or yeah, I completely I completely agree with that. You know, I wouldn't say it's not the choice of a landlord. It's the choice of whoever owns a business to decide what they want to do with it, isn't it? But, you know, it depends whether what becomes law and what becomes choice and who gets who gets the aggro over it. Well, it's not, suppose... law. It's not law to let someone in with clothing that you feel is appropriate. You know, it's it's the personal choice of the venue. Yeah. You know, yeah. so it's not, you can't, the government can't tell us how to do everything. You know, at some point, we've got to take responsibility for choices we make ourselves. One other question I would have before we move on to yet another row, and that's with the EU. How long would these passports be in place for? Because, I mean, certain countries require certain vaccination passports, for example, yellow fever, if you're going to certain parts of Latin America. And these kind of come in and out depending on the seriousness of how much it's in circulation. Obviously, COVID is going to be with us for for the foreseeable future, for a long time to come. Do you think that that would mean that if we did introduce vaccine passports, it would be a, a bit of a bumpy process to kind of get rid of them again? Or do you think we'd never get rid of them? Eve, I think you're asking a question that neither myself nor Stephen can answer. Neither of us are medical experts uh, and neither of us have got access to the required information to answer that. I, I would, what I would say is I, I saw, Matt, I think it was Matt Hancock the other day, don't know me to that, some government minister saying, it might become a yearly thing, like the flu vaccine, to have, have your jab. You know, you're then you're going into a whole new realm of, of things. I think, my, I think a very good idea would be to have international vaccine, uh, international vaccine passports, so people 
weren't coming into the country not vaccinated. And I think that's the easiest thing to do to start with. Obviously, it's harder for people that are already here. You know, people can lie, people can forge, people can mix. But, you know, if, if there's an international thing to stop the spreading of different variations, I think that's a, a good thing to look at. But what's the difference between a national passport and a passport that gets you into a pub, club or theatre? There's no difference whatsoever. It's just on a different scale. You either do it or you don't. Yeah, it's a very, very difficult topic, as you said, and one to which none of us have concrete answers. It's more just a case of thinking about possibly what could happen, what may happen. It's all conjecture at this point, obviously. Moving on to our next story, and that is the rising pressure on EU countries with the new third wave of cases, sluggish vaccine rollout and increased vaccine hesitancy due to the recent suspension of the AstraZeneca in multiple European countries. On Thursday, the EU stopped short of banning exports, but they are looking to toughen controls to ensure that AstraZeneca fulfills their contractual <coughs> obligations, which the EU have obviously said that they haven't. So could we be seeing vaccine nationalism already rearing its ugly head, even though we're only a couple of months into the rollout, do you think? It already, it already is rearing its ugly head and it's called the European Union. You know, they blatantly have made a mess of their vaccine rollout. And they're just trying to blame everyone but themselves for the for the mess that they're in, you know. And what what I find ironic is the the very same countries that are part of the European Union, which is moaning about AstraZeneca, a said that it wasn't efficate in people that were over sixty five when it is, um, and b said it wasn't as efficate as it as people are saying when it was. You know, so they're creating this scare story around one particular virus, what their motives for that are, I couldn't tell. And then moaning because they can't get enough of it. it to, to, to me, because I can only speak for myself, their position is absolutely ludicrous. Yeah, I, I wouldn't disagree. I mean, I've, I've had many problems with the, the old Brexit debacle anyway, as a Leave voter. Um, you know, I do think our government have, signed the way to certain things which which ain't helpful but in this instance the eu and just them being really it seems like i'm being petty and childish and and trying to prove a point and you know so many countries i mean to be fair the european union medical agency said that the vaccine was safe and countries taking it upon themselves to ignore the experts and ban it is obviously trying to prove a political point and and trying to hold things up. The one thing I would say about vaccine nationalism and a problem I have with with the vaccine rollout at the minute, not not in the UK, I think you know the government have done excellent. It is is looking at the big superpowers, so looking at like at the Americas, looking at the UK, the European Union, Australia, and them ensuring that like smaller countries core use the vaccine to recreate it in, in a cheaper way. And that becomes a nationalism. It's just like all the rich, powerful countries, I'm saying to the Africas of the world, you ain't having the vaccine on the cheap. And if they've got a vaccine that can cure the whole world, really, it should be given away for as, as little as, as it can, rather than charging extortionate amounts if, if smaller countries can't afford it. Which I believe, yes. which I believe is ha happening with the AstraZeneca uh, vaccine. It's being produced and distributed at cost, which isn't the case for Pfizer. And funnily enough, Pfizer hasn't come under the same pressure, has it? I just wonder, you know, uh, you know, are there any ulterior motives going on with this one? I mean, I did a bit of research on this subject, and it could be as simple as this. The UK contract was written apparently under English law, which is very, very specific and direct, whereas the EU contract was written under Belgian law, which apparently states best efforts to deliver you know whereas the uk says you will deliver the eu says you'll make your best effort to deliver well you know if the uk has tied itself up to a better contract and sooner it's not up to the eu to start criticizing and say well you know this isn't fair sort yourselves out and when you've got people like giver hofstadt who is like the arch european when you've got people like him criticizing the eu and the way they've dealt with this vaccine rollout then you can tell that the fault is on one particular side. Yeah, that actually feeds into kind of what I wanted to ask about. Obviously, the EU row is very, very prevalent in the, both the UK press and the EU press, I can imagine. 
But I suppose in the grand scheme of things, when we consider that a lot of countries haven't really received their first doses of the vaccinations, you know, delivered to them, that it can seem like quite a quite a pointless argument. Do, do we not think that perhaps more energy should be invested into helping third world countries, as you were saying, that are really struggling to get, get off the ground than debating over contractual finities, basically? Yeah, yeah I do. I mean, to be fair, and I understand how big pharma, well, I don't really understand it, but I see what big pharma does and stuff like that. There should be no patent on any vaccine like this, which, you know, the outcome is the death of the world. You know, if, if we don't cure this, then then we're all stuffed, really. You know, so if Africa have got a smaller countries, not necessarily just Africa, but countries in Africa have got the means to produce a vaccine cheaper than what they have to buy the AstraZeneca, then let's give them this, you know, the recipe kind of thing to the AstraZeneca vaccine and say, do your own thing. You know, we can't, we can't just hold all the cards because... International travel is still going to happen. African people are still going to come here. You know, people from s smaller countries and less far less wealthy than us are still going to come to this country. So, in essence, what they're going to do is they're going to bring disease with them, and they're going to bring an infectious disease with them because we're we're not allowing them to replicate a vaccine which we've got, which could save us all. I think that's a really really naive point of view. That, that, you know, to even imagine that you could say to a different country, "Go and build this vaccine producing facility like that," and they could and they could do it. It's just rubbish. I don't um, think that's the case, though. Is it? Saying if you've got the ability, what we need to do, Stephen, is fund properly the Covax scheme so that as as the vaccines are produced in the EU, in the US, in the UK that they are equally shared around the world. That's the way that we're going to get people vaccinated. And I believe, now correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe the UK is the second biggest contributor to the COVAX scheme. And there are countries in this world with much higher uh, disposable resources than the UK, such as China. Uh, and I'd like to see them really, really putting some effort into distribu distributing the vaccine. If you want to watch nationalism at work, don't keep aiming everything at the UK and the US. Point your guns at Russia and at, uh, and at China and at countries like that who have got the resources to get these vaccines out and about. This needs to be a global effort, not just put on the shoulders of countries like the UK, the EU and the US. I, I mean, to be fair, I did, I did say all the, you know, it was the Americas, it was the UK, it is the EU, it is the Australia, Australian countries, it is, you know, it ain't just us, but obviously I'm going to speak about our government because, you know, this that's the government I'm going to critique because that's the government I either vote for or, or don't vote for kind of thing. Well, you can't ask them to do something they've got no power to do. As I said, they've, say, got, they've, got, they've got power over... They're the second biggest funder of COVAX. And we're not the second biggest economy in the world. I don't know what else you expect our government to do. I think they're doing a really, really good job. But which I do as well. You know, not at any point have I ever knocked them for their the COVID vaccine rollout. But if we vote, if our country and the big five countries are voting against making uh, the vaccine patent free, so other countries that have got the ability to to recreate it can then to me there's a problem there the vaccine should be patent free and everybody who can do it should be able to do it and if they can't like you've said we should keep contributing to ensure that the world gets vaccinated and so should all the other countries who, who are in that position to do let's move on to another row that's kind of been engulfing the uk government this week and that is surrounding the flag the union jack so it all started when charlie state on bbc breakfast made a remark about the size of community secretary community secretary robert jemrick's union jack flag that was a bit of a mouthful to say um and he's come under criticism for poking fun at the flag as has co-host naga for liking tweets um some have been accusing them of betraying their country or undermining the pride in their country or the, the bbc of not being impartial and now the union jack will be flown from all uk government buildings every day rather than just on designated days of the year so my question for you guys is is the flag becoming increasingly politicized or is it still just a flag um, yeah, I, I think that is the problem. I think it's it's the government and not just the Conservative government, like the state governments 
for, through the years, I've always tried to take ownership of the flag. And what that to me, what they're trying to do is trick you into being patriotic without really following up on it. So they want us to associate the flag with the Conservatives and Labour want us to associate the flag with Labour. You know, Keir Starmer's got it draped all over him just as much as, as Boris Johnson has. But, you know, the flag doesn't make you patriotic. Although, you know, I'm sitting there drinking out of a Union Jack mug. That doesn't make me proud of everything that the state does. It makes, I'm proud to be British because of people like Emily Pankhurst and Andrew Ring and, you know, people like that was hated by the state. There was criminalised. There was, you know, everything they ever stood for, we was meant to think was unpatriotic. And actually, that they laid the foundations for for great things in Britain. You know, I don't, I don't really, I'm not proud of the British Empire and what they went off and did, and what you know, what we did in the 1700s in enslaving people. I'm proud of what's going on today, and I think we should focus on being proud of good things that are happening rather than historical nonsense. Stephen, your selective view of history continues to astound me. You make these big generic sweeping statements about the British Empire, um, focusing on one side of it only. There's good and bad in everything. In terms of the Union flag itself, because I think it's the Union Jack when you stick it on a ship. In terms of the Union flag itself, um, all I would say is look at Hong Kong at the moment, uh, a democratic part of a, a very small democratic part of a country, which is having that democracy squeezed out of it, slowly but surely. And which flag do the residents of Hong Kong hang as a symbol of hope? It's the Union flag. And it is a symbol of hope around the world, because I believe that the UK is seen as a forward thinking and progressive country around the world. We just seem in this country, and we've always had it, we seem to have a problem with kind of embracing the flag in the same way that the Americans, you know, the Americans revere the stars and stripes. You know, it's treated with the utmost respect. And that's not quite the same in the UK. Now that may just be down to the psyche of the UK people. But um, I think it's a symbol of national identity. I too, Steve, am proud to be British. Um, and I have got no issues whatsoever with the Union flag being flown on government buildings. I think it is a sign of pride in our country. Um, but what you get is you get, there's two extremes. There's the extreme left, um, who will do anything, in my opinion, to talk the country down, to talk the flag down. But then on the other side, you've got the extreme right who try to use the flag as, as this symbol um, of xenophobia. And I disagree with both of them. It is our flag. It is ours to own. It should be on government buildings. We should be proud of it. And I hope to see it. It's flying from the town hall all the time, I believe. And so it should. That actually brings me on to this next question that I wanted to bring up, actually, is that the flag has sort of been dragged into this culture war in the UK. And as you were saying, Sean, about the extreme left and the extreme right has left people who lie within the centre of that. Some are feeling that they're being shamed for support of the flag. Others are concerned about the increasing use of the flag. How do we find a happy medium? How can we sort of bring the flag back to being the flag of the country and not being used by both sides to further their political agenda? Ignore them. Let them do what they want. You do not have to listen to extreme, those on the extreme left and the extreme right. They're very, very entitled to their opinion. We live in a democracy, but we don't have to listen to what they say. Just because Stephen is drinking from a union mug, that does not mean that he's on the extreme right. It does not mean that he's on the extreme left. You know, it is a symbol. It is our flag and it should be flown. And, uh, you know, those that try to demean the way that other people are proud of it, just take no notice of them. I, I, I think it, it does get confusing on what, what, you, what you see and what you take from the union flag. Like, you know, especially with politicians using it so emphatically and putting it everywhere at the minute. You know, the government am standing in front of the union, Jack, to essentially give you know, nurses a pay cut over this period, you know, when being proud to be British at the same time as cutting the armed forces by 25,000, you know what I mean? It's like, 
what what makes us proud to be British shouldn't be what the government are doing. And if they're trying to hijack the flag or use the flag alongside what they're doing, whether it be good, you know, whether it just be the vaccine rollout, which has been amazing, or whether they've cut 25,000 troops from the front line, you know, we don't know what to associate it with. So I think in an ideal world, it would probably be better if the flag was less political and politicians probably stayed away from it unless it was an official announcement by the government, not just a politician giving an opinion like, like we are today. That is probably one of the most ridiculous things I've ever heard. A politician not standing in front of a flag. Uh, you know, this is naivety in the extreme. If you see a press conference from President Macron or President Biden or President Putin or any leader of any country, they will be stood in front of the flag of their country. It's got nothing to do with politics. It is the flag of a nation and the leader of the nation should be standing in front of that flag. And to try and tie that into a, you know, what you claim to be a pay cut for nurses, Stephen, come on, this is serious politics. You speak of pay cut for nurses, and that's exactly um, what I wanted to go on to talk about for our final story. We've got 10 minutes left, so I'm sure we'll have time for lots of interested opinions from both of you on this. The Scottish Government have offered NHS staff a pay rise of 4%. I should say that does include, uh, it does exclude some staff, so, um, I can't speak today, such as senior managers and doctors. They say, as in recognition of their service and dedication during the pandemic, this would mean that the average nurse would receive around £1,200 more a year, which compared to the 1% pay rise offered by the UK government, which would essentially be a pay cut in real terms if we take into account predicted inflation over the next year, which Sturgeon said was not enough. But the PM has said that there will be an independent review of the proposals to see basically what's going to happen with all of that. Do you think Sturgeon's announcement may lead to a change in Boris's approach? Or do you think Sturgeon's announcement is a political stunt because she and her party have dug themselves into an almighty great hole that they're struggling to get out of? Coincidence? I'm not sure. But, but to be fair, if it is a political stunt, then great. You know, we should have lots more political stunts where nurses have give, given pay rises. You know, at the minute... Who's going to get the cut to pay for that to pay for that four percent pay? Rate? Nobody has to get the cut. Don't just look at one side of the coin. Look at who's going to lose out to pay that money. Scotland already, as far as I'm aware, does not have enough money to fund its public services. Guess where that money comes from? But well, the British state, which got, got Scotland a part of and contribute? Yes, they to. are. They, they've got their own settlement. And she's offering this 4% pay rise, which the, the actual pay rise itself, to me, is irrelevant because I believe nurses and doctors and anyone else who's got us through this pandemic should be thanked and should be rewarded. And I'm pretty sure that it won't be a 1% pay rise that is agreed on in the end. But it's way above my pay grade. It really is. But the fact that she's announced a 4% pay rise a month before the elections in which her party's position in the polls are slipping, as is her vision of an independent Scotland, smacks of political opportunism. And anyone who sees it as anything other than that, I'm going to use that, that word again, is naive. But to be fair, political opportunism by Nicola Sturgeon is ensuring that nurses are getting a pay cut, which uh, sorry, a pay rise, which they deserve. And in 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 England, you know, it's forecasted that it will, if the one percent which they've agreed on or so far, you know, put forward, will be a pay cut for nurses. You know, and this isn't just on the Tories. This isn't just on Boris because Keir Starmer's calling for a two percent pay rise as opposed to a one percent which makes it, you know, just moving with inflation, really. Neither party at the minute seem to be grasping what the nation actually wants. We don't just want to clap for the NHS. We want them to be rewarded for what they've done. You know, they literally saved Boris Johnson's life and he's thanking them by proposing a pay cut. It, you know, it just doesn't make sense from whichever way you look at it to me. I wish Boris would, would be opportunistic and give our well-deserving nurses a pay rise. And I don't disagree with you. And as I've said, I don't think that the settlement will end up being 1%. But it's easy to throw in these glib, you know, again, we get these glib statements like, oh, we go out and clap for them, but we won't pay them. Yeah, 
we must pay nurses well, but they've had a 12% pay rise uh, last year, I believe, and no one's denying that. And what you've got to remember, Stephen, is this country has borrowed billions and billions and billions and billions of pounds to get us through this pandemic. That has got to be paid back somehow. And what you've also got to remember is as well as nurses and doctors and teachers and the police and everyone else who's in the public sector, yes, they deserve a pay rise. However, they do have job security. At the end of every month, their pay will go into their bank without fail. What you've got to look at now is the private sector who've been decimated during this pandemic. And it's the private sector that creates the wealth that pays for the public sector pay rises. Now, all this has got to be taken as one whole, not just as the private and the public sector. This has got to be put together. And again, it's way above my pay grade, but it's not me who sees the figures as to this is what we've got to pay back now. And this is what the country can afford. We just can't keep borrowing at these levels. So, you know, again, let's see where we end up. But it doesn't change my point that Nicola Sturgeon has done this through the pandemic full stop. Every time something's going to be announced by Boris, she's on the television an hour earlier saying, oh, we're announcing this first. It's so obvious. And she's done exactly the, exactly the same with this NHS pay offer. Let's see where it goes. So, um, yep. <laughs> I'm sorry, just one. Just had to gather my thoughts there for a second. So you were talking about the fact that we have borrowed a lot. We have borrowed an extraordinary amount over the last year. And at some point, as you say, we are going to need to pay that back. Where can we find a balance between, as Steve, you were saying, rewarding people who have worked incredibly hard throughout the pandemic and thanking them for their dedication and hard work? but also being pragmatic in terms of our future economic outlook and looking to make sure the economy doesn't take too harder a hit than is necessary. Well, I think in terms of nurses, if we don't retain their services, for instance, you know, we all end up dead. So there'll be no economy at all. Um, but the thing with, with the debt and the national debt, you know, we, sh we should have some truth in what's going on here. We have borrowed massive amounts of money but 90% of it has come from the Bank of England, which in this essence is an arm of the government. And it's at interest free rates. But sometimes it's at a negative interest rate. So actually you're getting paid to take the money. You know, this is what leading world econ economists are saying. It's not a myth. So although, yes, we have to pay it back in the long run. It's not like your credit card bill where you have to pay a certain amount every month. This debt that the government have lent themselves is open-ended and interest-free. So the, the only way to rebuild the country, like after the war, was to invest in nurses. You know, we've literally coming out, hopefully, the end of a war here. This is the worst thing that has ever happened in living memory, apart from people who can remember the war, kind of after my living memory. Um, so the only way to come out the other end, to me, is to invest massively, and that means securing our NHS, it means securing doctors, it means supporting the private sector, exactly like... Sean says, you know, we bailed out the banks to the tune of billions and billions, you know, so let's do it now with, with people that we need to actually make everybody survive. Sean? I don't, just don't know how to come back on that. I really don't, you know. To, to me, it's pretty simple. We, 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 we will offer rises in pay to the level that we can afford it. Uh, you know, it's irrelevant where the country's borrowed money from. It's borrowed money, and that money sits on the country's balance, and it makes it increasingly harder to borrow in future for infrastructure projects or for other things that we want to do when you're already so far in debt. Uh, you know, and I think back to, I mean, Steve, everyone keeps saying, oh, we bailed the banks out, we bailed the banks out. Imagine what would have happened if we hadn't bailed the banks out and you'd gone to your cash point to get some of your money out and it said, sorry, we had to bail the banks out and we bailed the banks out, sorry to be a little bit political here, under a Labour government, you know, but for some reason everyone keeps throwing it at a Conservative government. That's, that's just not the case. And we need to be, as you've said, Eve, pragmatic. That's the word. None of us thought a year and a half ago that we'd be in this position. 
and I'm glad, I'm really glad that we have had a Conservative government that has tried to get the national debt down so that we're in a position to be able to borrow to get us through this pandemic. Because if, if, if Jeremy Corbyn had been the Prime Minister and he'd borrowed to death before we'd even got to the pandemic, I really dread to think what position we would have been in right now. But, you know, we're on about nurses' pay. As I say, you know, we, none, of us, none of us know the exact figures. None of us are in a position to make those decisions. We can tell you what we would like to do and like to see. Uh, but your point about Nicola Sturgeon, I'll say it once more, political opportunism. Right, we have just over a minute left. So really quickly from both of you, just to round up, what other measures do we think we need to be supporting the NHS with? Away from pay, away from all of that, they've been through a very harrowing time. What would you like to see supporting the NHS coming out of this pandemic? And please do make your answer short or else we're going to run into the news. Um, quick, I mean, quickly, to be fair to the Conservative government, I think since Boris took over, the plans, and they seem to have invested a lot of money in the NHS, you know, obviously, coronavirus has, has mucked up a lot of things and requires a lot more. I just want to give £37 billion to Serco. I'd have just employed straight into the NHS. Uh, for me, Eve, it would be a continued Conservative government, both locally and nationally, to ensure, as Stephen has just said, that increased resources are constantly being pumped into the NHS. Thank you both ever so much for joining us and discussing the headlines. You're listening to Black Country Radio with Eve Bennett and Ian Murray. Don't go anywhere because just after 11, we'll be talking to Steve Clark about all things business and maybe even a little bit about all things football. And if you stay with us past Black Country Week, you'll be joined by Dan Richards, who's doing a special show in honour of World Theatre Day with great songs from great musicals and some very interesting guests from the world of theatre from the Black Country. Ian wants to say something now. I like musicals. Do you? Yeah. I just want to point out as well for, for people who couldn't who were watching on Facebook stream, Steve Ed was there, was in his pants. <laughs> right, and with that we'll go into the news here on Black Country Radio. <laughs>